The best movie of 2022 is finally out on streaming. You can watch it at home. It's about time. It's everything, everywhere, all at once. The film that, if it was any less good, no one would remember that title. And yet, it's probably the best movie of the year. So everyone will remember that title forever, all at once. But here's the thing about this movie. Everything it does is practically perfect. I would say that this is as close to a perfect movie as you can get period. It is absolutely fantastic. Everything it does, it nails. From the start all the way to the finish. And that starts with the first act. Now, the first act is very simple. It is about Evelyn and her little family. Joy, her daughter, and Waymond, her husband, and their her father, whose name I'm forgetting. And it's basically an indie drama. The first 20 minutes or so is an indie drama with Evelyn running around trying to do everything all at once. I'm gonna keep using this title as a, as a ploy to talk about this movie. Evelyn is trying to juggle a lot of things all at once. Everything, everywhere, all at once in her life. She owns this laundromat that she's trying to take care of. She's trying to cook dinner for her family and her dad who's in town. And she's trying to do her taxes all while everyone around her needs things from her. So she's trying to juggle all this stuff and in fact is doing none of it. She's trying to do so much that she ends up doing nothing, really. It's an incredibly effective opening, to be serious. This opening, I think, is awesome, because not only does it hold its cards really close to the chest, if it was, if you were playing poker against this first act, you would lose. You would lose. It's just an indie drama. Joy is trying to introduce her girlfriend to Evelyn's dad, and Evelyn feels a little weird about it because she's kind of traditional, and her dad's very traditional, so she's kind of nervous about that. And so she, Joy is trying to talk to Evelyn about it, and Evelyn keeps putting it off while doing all these other activities. Waymond is trying to talk to her about potentially getting a divorce, and she keeps putting that off too. All of these very serious things she should be dealing with that she's actively not dealing with because she thinks other things are more important. Oh, the laundromat's more important. Oh, Oh, cooking dinner for my dad is more important. Oh, this woman with a big nose is more important. All these things that she thinks are more important that actually aren't, but she just has priorities wrong. And it's a very relatable thing. I mean, everybody at some point in their lives has people that do this or are that person. And so starting it off like this, the first 12 minutes, just her running around like her head's chopped off working while everybody's quote unquote bugging her is so relatable. You can, you do that every day or someone you know does it every day. So it's a perfect opening, absolutely perfect. He doesn't have to stay. Who's he? Becky. Becky's a she. You know me, I always make that he, she. In Chinese, just one word, ta, so easy. And the way you two are dressed, I'm sure I'm not the only one calling him he. I mean her, him, I. Anyways, my English is fine. Not only is this first act like flawlessly executed in terms of setting everything up, Evelyn, her family, her struggle, this laundromat, her husband, and their plight with the taxes and the IRS, it sets all that up perfectly, but also the structure, it's real tight. It's like my butthole after I haven't pooped in a couple days. Real tight. But I mentioned the IRS. The IRS is basically the, the villain at the start of this, and the family has to go in to talk to Deidre, I think is her name, played by Jamie Lee Curtis, who's auditing them. And she, they bring in a whole stack of things that she has to look through. But right before they go, Waymond changes. He becomes, as we know him later, Alpha Waymond. And, Way and he sets up the story for us. He sets up the plot beautifully and exactly when it needed to. <laughs> Typically around the 12 minute mark, you have the catalyst, which is the point of the, the story when our hero, in terms of a hero's journey, which this is, learns about the plot. There's a catalyst saying, okay, this is happening. And that's what happens here. Wayman says, hey, I'm from a different multiverse. Put these things on and I'm going to literally make your life flash before your eyes. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but when the elevator doors open and she literally watches her life flash before her eyes, a couple of things happen that I love that we can talk about more later as well. But the shooting style changes and the aspect ratio changes. In the first act, most of it is shot from 1.8 
nine to one, and then it cuts into 1.33 to one. I think I'm remembering that right. And I love that. And we could talk more about later why this is happening because it continues to play with aspect ratios and filmmaking styles that we can talk about a lot more. But the biggest reason why this is happening is simply because the aspect ratio they're shooting at to start this movie is called Academy Ratio. And it's for dramas. Usually it's a, for dramas. And that's the first act. It's a drama. And so when she's watching the, her life flash before her eyes, it's the past. Obviously. So we cut into a 1.33 to 1 aspect ratio, tightening the image, and it's shot on film, so it gives it this feeling of being kind of old. Real simple stuff, but real effective. So now we get to the taxes, the most important part of the story, with Jamie Lee Curtis, who's hilarious in this movie. I, I absolutely loved her performance. It's very physical, and she nails it. Uh, I love that she how she's eating cookies and stuff. Like, But this is the part of the story typically is called the debate where our hero is trying to figure out whether or not they want to go into the story, where they want to cross the th threshold between their past life and what they're trying to work towards. Now you can either come with me and live up to your ultimate potential or lie here and live with the consequences. I want to lie here. Evelyn gets this note about the multiverse instructions, sort of. It says to do this weird thing and then focus on something, and then she can go into another multiverse. So you get introduced very vaguely into this multiverse, but what it does, again, with the filmmaking is special, real special stuff, because it's never jarring, and it always feels good. And in a movie like this, when characters are jumping between multiverses, it's very difficult to pull that off. But it does that really well with editing, really simple editing too. Evelyn's sitting at her chair, and when she jumps to the multiverse, her chair shoots back and she's going crazy into this janitor's closet and it splits down the middle showing a fractured version of herself because she's in two realities simultaneously so you get that visually very simple she's in one reality and she's in another and then as she's jumping between these realities Waymond will occasionally reach and grab her and literally pull her into the other one or Jamie Lee Curtis will pop up and it pulls her into the other universe and visually it does a great job of keeping the audience involved in what's happening and keeping them understanding what's happening without being jarring because if you were to just cut between multiverses it can get confusing i can imagine it could get confusing very quickly but doing these simple things wayman grabs her and pulls her into this universe that keeps her and us connected to the story in a way that works our time here is up they're gonna kill us what do you think you can give us more time so we can redo all this? Do not worry. This is just a bone of universe we're using for communication. <laughs> but the first act comes to a close with one of my favorite action scenes in the movie when Wayman kicks some ass with a fanny pack. And it's awesome. <laughs> And it's another scene where the filmmaking is just special because it's an action scene. So typically you watch an action scene in movies and there's many pitfalls of shooting action. One, you can cut way too fast. You start editing way too fast and the audience has no idea what's happening because you can't see what's happening because it's cutting too fast. And then two, you have a really wide angle, which shows the action in a wide angle, and that doesn't sound bad, but then you get a good look at choreography. So your choreography has to be spectacular for wide angles. And frequently, it just isn't. But this movie balances the, that style perfectly, both. It does a really good job of cutting quick enough to give the scene pace, action pace, and it keeps it wide enough to where you can tell what's happening while also cutting close to things that are important. And that's what it does very well. When you can understand what's important in the scene, you're golden. <laughs> Using close-ups at the right time is so critical to making a movie, not just an action scene, but just a movie, because you can understand what something is important immediately by the use of a close-up. But if you use too many close-ups, then nothing's important. So this movie does a really good job of saying, hey, this is uh, important. Look, there's a gun on the ground. And then it can use the camera to pivot around the scene to show who acknowledges that that thing is important.
Now this leads into the second act, which is arguably the most difficult to pull off in any movie because you have so many things you have to do. It's the longest act of a movie. It usually is a good half of your movie is the second act if you're doing it right first 25 to 30 minutes is your first act and then 15 to 20 minutes at the end is your third act and then the middle chunk is most of the movie so you have to do a lot in this space you have to continue the story the between the break into two and the midpoint is usually fun in games where our character or characters are learning about the, the plot and they're kind of coming into their own. They're figuring out their abilities, they're figuring out what they can do, what they, can't they do, and it's usually with a mentor, in this case Alpha Waymond, and in this case Evelyn is trying to figure out how to verse jump, which is simply do weird things and you will end up in a multiverse where you can take that multiverse version of yourself and learn what they can do immediately and do what they do. So she's trying to figure out how to verse jump, how to take other versions of herself and use their abilities. That's the fun in games, and it's awesome. It is fantastic. It's so much fun. Action scene after action scene after action scene is so perfectly executed. Like I said in this, the one with the kick-ass fanny pack scene, it just way that they use the camera is spectacular not to mention it does a pretty good job still of keeping up with your characters you understand who everybody is still you understand what they're trying to accomplish it's very clear the narrative is very very clear here and we finally get introduced to the villain the main villain is joy evelyn's daughter so and that's important obviously because not only because it's the villain but because it's the daughter of our main character and because she has a very clear motivation that we can learn about a little bit more later she's nihilistic very nihilistic <laughs> But we get a bunch of kick-ass action scenes, and then we hit our midpoint, which comes a little bit late, and that's one of my issues with this movie, is that the fun and games portion of the movie, I think, goes on a little too long. The midpoint should come at the midpoint. Obviously. But this is about 10 minutes past where the movie is actually at its midpoint. Unfortunately, the midpoint of it is in the middle of an action scene. And a midpoint typically is used to give the audience a false high or a false low. So you are understanding that the story is coming to some kind of a climax. Somewhere out there in all that Don't leave! Help! Please! Help! Help! I've never loved it when movies break the fourth wall like this, where they cut to the credits. But in this, it works flawlessly. Not just because the multiverse, they can do whatever they want, but they established early on that one of the versions of her, it made a movie where she's the star and she's basically watching the movie that we're watching, except the ending is different for her. So she watches this movie and it ends just like we saw. But that's a different version of the movie, if you know what I'm saying. And this is the first part of the movie where we start to really see Evelyn jumping between multiverses. Not just having multiverses in her subconscious or her conscious. She's jumping between them and going crazy. A little bit crazy. And that's big, a big part of this second half of the second act. Which is typically bad guys close in. And that just simply means what you think it means. The bad guys get a little bit closer. Things start going bad. Things start getting much worse, and we're building up to our climax. And in this case, things start getting worse in, in that not only is she dead, but now she's trying to figure out how to not be dead, or how to get her daughter back, or how to get back to her reality. Lots of things that are not going well for her. But she's jumping around between these realities. She's seeing all these versions of herself and seeing all the things that she's doing in different realities. And I think she describes it as her clay pot. Her brain is breaking because she can't focus on anything. She keeps jumping between these realities and it's, it's overwhelming. You get to see all these different things and it's comedic and it's fun. But there's some darkness there that works. But after that, this is when the real meat of the story rears its head. This is when you learn exactly what this is going for. And that is not nihilism. Oh, 
But you see how everything breaks What? Gets washed away in a sea of every other possibility. When I first watched this movie, I was like, wow, they're really just going for a nihilistic message because Joy is trying to find a version of her mother that's like her. And and what I mean by that is Joy is experiencing every reality all at the same time. So she can jump between every reality, but every reality exists inside of her all at once. And she just says, you know what? All of these different versions of me that exist, infinite versions of me exist, that means that me, th in one reality, it doesn't matter. Because there's so many versions of me. So me, I'm insignificant, it don't matter, it doesn't matter. Oh, there's 15 other me's that are doing this exact same thing in different realities, but one hair is different, or this pillow is a little different. That means that I don't matter. And that's her thought process. I don't matter. So she's trying to find her mom in a different reality that can sympathize with her. And that's basically why the first half of this movie, or a little bit more, is her, Joy, and her acolytes trying to kill Evelyn. They're not really trying to kill her, and well, they are, but th the main reason behind that, the logic behind trying to kill Evelyn is to push her to the extreme where her brain cracks, like Joy's does, and she can experience every re reality all at once, just like Joy is, so that they can have a mutual sympathy and maybe figure something out. <laughs> What are you doing? No, no, no. And Evelyn has cracked. So now you get a lot of scenes between Evelyn and Joy where they're trying to figure out each other. And at first I was like, wow, this is very nihilistic because now Evelyn is just not very nihilistic. Oh, nothing matters. You're right. And it really doubles down on that in a way that made me really uncomfortable but in a good way because she goes between all these realities that we've set up very clearly. One with Ratatouille but with a raccoon, one where there are rocks, one where they have hot dogs for fingers, one where she's at the laundromat like normal but has like a, a red jumpsuit type thing on, like a, a sweater and this red jacket or whatever. And she's going between all these realities and a movie star and just ruining them because nothing matters, right? So in every reality, if it nothing matters, why don't I just ruin all of my lives? Because it nothing matters, right? I, there's so many versions of me. I'll just ruin all of my lives possible. Do whatever I want. I can do whatever I want because there's a hundred bajillion versions of me doing other things. I'll just do whatever because it doesn't matter. And I went, wow, this is heavy. This is crazy. I can't believe we're getting away with this message, guys. This is nuts. But then the movie shifts. And boy, does my face become Seven Peaks because waterworks are going crazy here at this part of the movie. The waterworks, it's like a 12 gauge shotgun. I'm just sniping people with geysers from my eyes. Because it's so relatable, man. Oh, it's so relatable. Everybody, I'm convinced, has people in their lives with relationships they want to be better. Or with relationships they've ruined and they want to not be ruined. Or relationships with family members that could benefit that each other more. You know, everybody has relationships in their lives that aren't going well. Or everybody has parents or siblings in their lives that there's distance and you wish there wasn't. And that's why this works so well. Because every single person has something like this. And so it isn't just nice to see two characters on a screen come together finally. Because it is. The whole movie is about Joy and Evelyn learning to understand each other and learning that, yeah, okay, nothing matters, but there's infinite versions of us doing infinite versions of things, and yet I'm in this reality with you, and that's where I want to be. Maybe there is something out there, some new discovery that will make us feel like even small pieces of shit. 
Something that explains why. You still went looking for me. Through all of this noise. And why? No matter what. I still want to be here with you. Uh-oh. Super soakers. <laughs> Simple as that. That's basically everything everywhere all at once. A movie so effective, so relatable, and so well done, everybody should watch it. And everybody would like it. I'm convinced. Even the most prudish, nitpicky, loser, asshole guy would probably like this. Unless you're incredibly prudish about like dildo jokes, sex jokes, that type of thing. And if you don't want to see somebody trying to stick a butt plug themed trophy, maybe not <laughs> themed, but a, a trophy that looks like a butt plug into their butt to try and jump into another multiverse. If you don't, if you th hear that and say, <laughs> but stalker is better or <laughs> It's not Marvel, or <sighs> this wasn't based on a book. If you do, if you do any of that, maybe not for you. Maybe, but it could be. Still, I don't think anything's gonna top it this year. Definitely not Top Gun Maverick. And I know some people out there are probably gonna say Top Gun is the best movie of the year, and you haven't seen this. So shut up. <laughs>